Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 196. This episode is with my new friend, Chip Beeman, who not only is a co-founder of the amazing Help Network, he's also one of the kindest people I've ever met, and super inspiring, I gotta say. In this episode, we talk about him working as a nightclub promoter in New York, getting into game testing, what that job actually entailed, building a VO department from the ground up, the process of creating the HALP network, and so much more. Chip is a great dude, and I am so excited for you all to get to know him. So let's just get right into this one. Without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 196, with Chip Beeman. Theme song time. How's your day going? Good overall? So far, so good. A little busy, but, uh, you know, it's a Monday. It's what's expected, so it's going all right. That's true. That's true. I So I, I have a really important question that I've been meaning to ask you for a very long time. Sure. What's going on? Given your one-man war on the flavor atrocities of Oreo. Oh, my God. <laughs> how are we feeling about that last one? I need to know because the most Oreoist of Oreos is out, and you're the only person I care about their opinion on this. All right. So, you, first of all, you are 100 percent correct. I, I am a traditionalist. I like the original Oreo. I can even go double stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, but you know, every other to- type and, and variety that they've come out with has been just atrocious and <laughs> i know there are some people who love them uh i just think that they're you know they're the bane of my existence i've actually i've actually on twitter i've threatened N- nabisco <laughs> and mario to you know a fight after school uh yes you know meet me in the you know meet me at the <laughs> playground three, right. you know type of thing right so please stop with this affront um <laughs> but i will say Oh, that I'm I'm I am I am clear on my mission. Yes, but that said, uh, I know golden Oreos are pretty decent. Okay, okay, and and uh, and then yes, you're right. I did have the most Oreo Oreo, which is the one that came out recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is not bad. It's, not, it's bad. not bad. Okay, it's not bad. I won't give it like you know a ten out of ten or anything like that. Sure, but, sure, sure. Got to um, stick to your guns. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna let you have the satisfaction. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but it is it's not a bad Oreo. And I know that the, some of the other ones aren't bad either, you know, but like you know, cherry cherry cola Ugh. Oreos, that's horrible. There was a candy corn Oreo that was horrible. Ooh. Ooh. There was a lemon lime and a watermelon, those were horrible. Oh no. So I'm just you know, I, I'm just like, just stop doing that. Just stop it. <laughs> You're killing it. Feeling. It's killing me. It's killing me. <laughs> okay, so where where does not bad rank against decent? Um, so like the most Oreo Oreo versus the golden Oreos. Where are we at? I, I would put golden Oreos uh, ahead of the not bad Oreos. Interesting. The most Oreos, yeah. I would say in in order, it would probably be the original Oreo, double stuff, golden, and then most Oreo, the uh, Oreo, and then after that, uh, they all are are way down the list. <laughs> There's a huge gap of affronts, and then I guessed cookies, maybe watermelon Oreo just sounds wrong. Yeah, yeah, and it is just yeah. so you know. Have you have you tried them all? Is there a kind that you haven't tried yet? No, I have not tried. I won't. <laughs> just out of principle <laughs> out of principle exactly and i know that people are like you should try it don't knock it into it i'm like no i'm not i can knock it and not try it i could do that i'm a grown-ass man i, I respect your conviction <laughs> yeah i could say i don't like it and not ever have tasted it <laughs> that's true i i've never stuck a fork in a socket and i have no plans to 
There you go. Exactly. I know that I won't like it. I know that I know me well enough to know I'm a traditionalist, a purist. This is what I want. Right. Matter of fact, my sister, uh, growing up, my sister and I used to fight um, over the difference between, and I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, are you familiar with Hydrox? No. What is that? So Hydrox, and I actually do think that Hydrox came first. I, I, I remember looking this up, but I don't remember. But Hydrox is the other Oreo. It's the other sandwich cookie that it looks almost identical. Really? Yeah. Um, H Y D R O X. And they were out at the same time. They sat next to Oreos on the shelf and they were like the next biggest seller, Whoa. right? If you, want, if you didn't want Oreos, you had to hire them. That's so weird. And they were first. I believe they were first. Interesting. And my sister loved them. And I hated them. I thought they were just, <laughs> there, there was definitely, a, there was a, a taste difference. And certainly there was a, uh, a soak, you know, the soak factor, right? Uh-huh. Oh yeah. So there was, this there is was, science. You know, hydro, exactly. So um, 100% the Hydrox didn't have a soak factor at all. Ironically enough, they're called Hydrox Hydro. Well, hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So that was a, a big fight between my sister and I, but. <laughs> uh, I, I, I had them. I, I thought they were disgusting. And then I said, I'm going to stick to my traditional Oreos. And that's where I've been ever since I was a kid. Uh huh. Okay. So, so there's probably something here as well that like the one that you stuck by betrayed our taste buds. It's like, dude, I stuck by you during the Hydrox Wars. And then you yes. get watermelon. Yeah. You know what? Boom. You're on to something. <laughs> that's absolutely right. You're on it. That's why I think that's what my therapist was trying to tell me. Right. <laughs> and I'm free, Chip. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So that was that was in New York, right? You're from New York? Yeah. Born and raised in Yonkers, New York, just outside Yonkers. of Yonkers. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Home of, uh, home of Otis Elevators and Roosevelt High School, where... Uh, oh, I can't remember. Alice Cooper, I think, went to school in my my um my school. Mm-hmm. People said hello and, to Dolly. Uh, All kinds of stuff happened there. What kind of stuff were you into growing up? Oh wow. Um, depends on what age you're talking about. But oh, good point. When I was younger, um, in the you know in the preteen era, mm-hmm. I would say that I was you know I was playing a lot of um of was playing a lot of sports, you know, I was into baseball and softball and football, like all, you know, like many young people are. Nice. Um, so, you know, I played out in the street and I played in my friend's, you know, driveway and we'd go out to the courts and play there. And, um, but I soon got into um, uh, a, my friend's brother was a DJ. Nice. And, yeah, he was a huge DJ, and uh, he would go out and do parties and things like that. And you know, then he would practice at home, and we'd go by the house and we'd you know listen to him DJ, and he'd get all these records in from the record pools, and you know, we'd be like the first to hear all of these songs, and um, it was great because we would sit there and just kind of like sit and listen and dance, and and I really got into the whole DJ culture, and you know, by the time I got to be I don't know, maybe 19 or something. Uh, I started my own business, um, which was a basically an entertainment company, DJs, bands, catering, florists. Oh, um, dude. I, yeah, I just I happen to know just a lot of people who owned, you know, delis and restaurants. And I knew a couple of people, oddly, who owned florists, uh, flor- uh, you know, flower shops. And I knew a bunch of DJs. And so I started this company and... Uh, called Nighthawk. It was Nighthawk. Inter- Love it. And um, people would call me up for their sweet 16s and their bachelor and bachelorette parties. And uh, I was I had DJs that were working out of local nightclubs. And, you know, I did that for a couple of years. Actually, people got to know who I was and invited me down to Studio 54 and MKs and Mars and, Dude. and uh, Limelight and, 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 you know, famous New York City nightclubs. Yeah. And I would go hang out there because of my little my my little company <laughs> dude look at you yeah so i was an i was a nightclub promoter for about five years uh before i moved out to california wow 
that's smart being like a one-stop shop having like florists and a bunch of different other things it's corner in the market good for you yeah yeah it's it was it was pretty easy because people would call me and be like hey do you have a dj and i'm like sure and do you need you know florist do you need you know party planning do you need this that the other and they would be like yeah i, I need all of these other things do you have them i'm like yeah <laughs> yeah and i would just end up you know getting these uh these really big parties and putting it all together for people like you know i was even a wedding planner uh for a short bit Ooh. and and that was uh that was a lot of well no it was painful it was right. really <laughs> the nightclub stuff was fun though that was actually a lot of fun what's more stressful planning a, planning a wedding or promoting a nightclub oh promoting a nightclub really how come yeah um because the wedding for me was like a one-off gotcha and and really was like they knew people knew what they want. They might not be happy, but right. they know what they want. <laughs> they, you know, they're generally they know what they want. The nightclub, especially nightclub owners and managers, they especially new ones, they really don't know what they want, and oh. they don't understand the, the what a DJ does and and how a DJ works within the nightclub environment. So, for instance, a, a DJ will move, and and you won't see this necessarily in the club, but you'll see it at a wedding. Mm -hmm. but oddly enough right. but a dj will move people on and off the dance floor right they're paying attention to what people are dancing to and what they're interested in and they'll move people off the floor and back onto the floor and in a nightclub the idea is to keep people moving back and forth you want oh, people on the dance floor no. for a while and then you want them to get off the floor because you need to go to the bar oh, so, right. so they spend money at the bar and what a lot of people, especially inexperienced managers, they're really just like, your dance floor is not packed all night long. Why, what's going on there? And it's because we're not supposed to keep the dance floor packed all night long. I mean, right. it's 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 to get a group of people on the dance floor and then move them off and bring on a new group of people and have that switching back and forth so that the bar is constantly getting people at the bar drinking and spending money. And gotcha. you and to have the right DJ, to have the right ambiance, to to have the right management staff understand that, uh, and then to do it night after night after night, and to make sure that people are coming to your to your event, that is way more stressful because if people don't show up, you don't have a job. Oh, good point. And then I, I assume it's a lot of reputation. So like, if you do a good job, great. If you do a bad job, oof. Yeah, people are never going to come again interesting okay are there any like specific events that you think back on like this one was was pretty wild yeah i used to do this thing called um cruise party Ooh, okay i'm already in and, <laughs> and we did it uh labor day weekend we did it the monday of labor day oh no sorry the sunday before labor day the sunday before labor day nice and we would it started off with us just renting like a, a fishing boat uh, oh. out of New Rochelle, New York. Um, and we would have like, I don't know, it, when it started, it was like 25, 30 people on board. I don't even think it was that many. I think the first one I did was like 15 people. And, you know, you pay extra amount of dollars. And I had, you know, six foot subs coming in from, you know, all of Classic. my- Classic. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Six foot subs and big ZD. That I remember. It was like yeah, that's yeah. what we had. And we had a keg on board. And um, you know, that was supplied by the people who I knew, like those vendors that I was telling you about that I I, I knew. Uh, they would give me a really good deal on all the food, and we'd have one of my DJs would get on board, and you know, 15, 20 people would just have a great time for three hours on this boat. Yeah. But um by the time i did it the second time it got to like 30 and 40 people and then by the time i did it the third time it was like 100 people and i had rented out a big boat and Ooh. by the time the fourth and fifth one uh i had done were you know i was renting out like a yacht like three Dude. floors i had djs <laughs> i had karaoke i had you know catered food it was great and the thing about it was for you as the you know the consumer the person who was going it was all my clients but anybody could go it was like 40 bucks oh and dude you drink all night long that's amazing yeah it was a, it was a great it was a great event i really loved doing it and so many people after it was over 
just kept like, you got to do this like a couple of times a year. Yeah. And I, was like, <laughs> yeah I don't know if I want to do that because it kind of loses that, you know, that cachet, you know, the fact that it's kind of a, a one off every year. Right. Keep them wanting more. Yeah. And because I was because I was also doing the nightclub promoting at the same time when the boat docked at night, you know, so it was like nine or 10 o'clock at night. I mm-hmm. gave everyone free tickets to get into the nightclub. So you. You know, immediately I'm bringing, you know, 150 people from the boat over to the nightclub, which is down the street from where the docks were. And they would go in and they get like, you know, front of the line pass and a free drink. Dude. And I would offload my my <laughs> my legal responsibilities for serving them <laughs> so much alcohol. I would offload it to the nightclub. So it out. <laughs> I just had to get them from I had to get them from the dock to the nightclub safely. So we would call a cab company and make sure that there was a bunch of cabs outside when the boat docked so that people were encouraged to get in a cab. This is well before Uber and all that kind of stuff. Sure. So we had cabs uh, lined up outside the dock and they would just go over there and they would get drunk over there and the, you know, the club would take on the responsibility. This sounds like the greatest time ever. It was. How, how are you? Are you naturally good, like organized at doing these kinds of things, or was there a learning curve? Like, okay, I got to think about this, and then kind of facilitate this. Like, you sound like the Willy Wonka of a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this all kind of came naturally. I mean, I, I wow. I, like I said, I started when I was young. I mean, even before the the nightclub stuff, I had like a lawn mowing business and i had a a uh, what do you call it shoveling snow shoveling business mm-hmm. it was called uh it was called field testers nice we everything we went around the neighborhood and you know during the winter we'd you know shovel and during the summer we'd mow lawns wow and it, and it was like you know i had my own business i had a, you know i had my commodore 64 computer oh yeah <laughs> all set up and you know with a database and you know, it, that's how I, I, I ran businesses ever since I was like 16. Wow. That's, you know, I'm no longer surprised that you are where you are now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is that? What, what am I? What, what you, 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 f- you found some sort of success in life, Chip, and now I see that it was destined. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This was, it was, uh, I've always just been that kind of, kind of organized guy, you know, always putting on shows and plays. Matter of fact, even um, before I moved out here, I was working for the Westchester Broadway Theater in yeah. Elmsford, New York, and I was a uniformed stagehand for a whole bunch of, you know, off-Broadway shows. Nice. So I was either a stage manager or I ran lights, you know, or, you know, I was, you know, an actual stagehand. And, you know, my job was to make sure the actors got up on, you know, got out on stage and I set pieces and I, you know, ran curtains and, you know, did dry ice and fog and that whole, you know, I always liked behind the scenes. I never really liked being out in front, Mm -hmm. you know, like I don't want to be on stage. I don't need to, I don't like giving speeches and stuff like that. I'm, I, I like being, you know, one of the key people behind the scenes. Yeah. The backbone of the productions. Yeah. Yeah. Have, did you ever think about opening your own club? Or were you like, oof, that's that's too many, much. many times. And yeah. matter of fact, <laughs> some people I, I, I had a conversation very recently where someone asked me, um they asked me if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, what would I be doing? And I said I'd probably be I'd probably be running a nightclub. Yeah. What would you call it? Uh, I, I I don't know anymore because I knew the new the names that I had back in the day were um were stupid <laughs> <laughs> so uh i remember i was living i i was living um in yonkers and I, one of my best friends her name was patty mm-hmm. and we were going to call our nightclub because she was going to do it with me uh you know pie in the sky dreaming stuff uh-huh. but we were call it ccps for okay. chocolate chip, yeah, chocolate chip patties. I like that's, that. That could be yeah, worse. Was, <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. And no one would know that it, that's what it stood for. But chocolate chip patties <laughs> where it was coming from. Okay. Um, and and then I I told her I was moving up to California, mm-hmm. and um, she says I'll come out there and we'll we'll call it um we'll call the nightclub aftershock or or we'll call it tremors, you Ooh, know something yeah. like that. <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> thinking of the whole earthquake thing. And I was like, and back then I thought that was a brilliant name. Now I think it's stupid. <laughs> um, Aftershock could still work. That's not bad. There's already a club called Aftershock, or at least oh, there was. Okay. Yeah. So we had to fight them. Yeah. <laughs> After school at three o'clock. Yeah, exactly. You <laughs> and Oreos. We'll see you there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've, you know, I, I don't know what I would call it now. And certainly my my thoughts about what the nightclub would be are way different than when I was, you know, when I was younger in my 20s. Sure. More or less boats now. Oh, very you know, less boats. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think the nightclub I would do now would be much more. Um, I mean, I think there would be like a high energy night, but I think it would be a much more of a lounge. Oh, I like that. Yeah, much more relaxed, people chilling out, having really good drinks, really good food. Uh, not necessarily that, that it's a restaurant, but, you know, some some food. Yeah, but, a little bit of bacon, you know, maybe. <laughs> do I know you, Chip, or do I know you? Dude, did you just like scour my, Dude, <laughs> my social media? Did nobody warn you about the level of research I do on these things? <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. I'm I, here I, for I, you. I knew bacon I knew bacon was coming up. I just didn't know when. <laughs> you gotta seize your moment. <laughs> when did you move to LA then? Uh I moved out to LA in uh May of nineteen ninety-five. Wow. Had you been before? Yeah, I visited many times. I have family out here, uh, okay, cousins. Cool. Out here. So I was visiting and uh, with my mom and dad, and we'd come out and visit. And my sisters lived out here, right? You know, prior to my moving out here. Actually, that was one of the reasons why I moved to California is because I was growing up without my sisters. Ah, uh, that'll do it. So we're a very close family. So I, uh, I made it. I was living back in New York with my mom. I made a deal with her that basically said, "Hey, look, I'm not going to stay. Uh, I'm not going to stay in this house forever. So right. I'm going to move out to California for a year and see if I like it. If I do, um, I'll give you a call and ask you if you want to come. And if you say yes, I'll come back here. We'll move you out, and we'll all be together in California. If you say no, I will come back." Cause I'm not going to let you stay in New York uh, by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I just won't come back to the house, but I'll, I will come back to, uh, I will come back to, to New York and, you know, live nearby and, and you know, take care of you. Yeah. And then a year, a year and a month later, I called my mom. That's exactly what I did. Uh, and I said, Hey, you want to come? And she said, yes. So I oh, went back I and that. sold the house and we all lived within five minutes of each other out in LA. That's so special family, man. Very close to family, even today. I mean, my mom's gone, my dad's gone, but mm -hmm. me and my uh, my two sisters and I, we have sibling day. Matter of fact, we just planned it for uh, March 5th. Oh, we cool. Do sibling day four times a year where it's just, you know, just the three of us, nobody else, no husbands or wives or kids or, you know, nobody else. Just the three of us get together. We spend the day together doing whatever we want. We can go to the movies, we can just hang out and talk, we can whatever but we it's it's all about us just being close ah oh, that's so important it is especially because life everyone's living your own lives it gets complicated and everyone's busy to intentionally make time to continue that relationship that's so cool that's exactly what we do it's so important um and i you know like i said i'm you know I, it's not just about the oreos i'm a traditionalist i like <laughs> I, I like having the the family you know the family values and the having the family fun and, you know, we try and get together many, many times throughout the course of the year with my entire family doing just fun things. My, my, my cousin who I was visiting when I was younger, she just celebrated her 90th birthday two, two weeks ago. Good for and her. We all hanging out with her for the entire day, which was awesome. And then she went to a Bruno Mars concert. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's how you do it. <laughs> well, she I, 90 years old. She was the one partying her ass off in Vegas. Look at that. And, uh, and everybody else was out cold. And she was the one, <laughs> you know, the entire time dancing to Bruno Mars. Goals. <laughs> mm -hmm, I, I mm -hmm. have a new hero. <laughs> exactly. Hashtag goals. Yeah. How soon after you moved to L.A. did you get into game testing? One week. One week? One week. How? How how'd you find it? I uh, I moved out here and I had uh, an opportunity for two job interviews. Mm -hmm. One was uh, an assistant or like a PA at 
uh, Sony A and R. Uh, nice. So they basically said I can go and you know do this job, and it was paying a, a decent amount of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other was to go be a game tester at uh, what was then the brand new Disney Interactive. Christ. It had only been Disney and Interactive had only been around for like a year or a little less than a year. And you know, I kind of thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, do I want to go do this and get paid good money? Sure. Or do I want to go do this other thing? where I get to play games all day and make a little less money. And I was like, Fuck it. What, the, what the hell? Yeah. Let me, go, <laughs> let me go do that game stuff. So I did. Uh, I went and had one of the worst interviews I've ever given in my entire life. <laughs> no. It was horrible. Uh, the manager's name, I still remember his name was Jeff Blattner. He was our manager. And he, uh, he called me on the phone. He was a friend of my sister's. And... Um, they, you know, he had told her they were looking for uh, some testers to come in and work. And they were, you know, he knew about me. And I was like, okay, I'll do this interview. Get on the phone with him. And he asks me, uh, so what games do you play? And I'm like, you know, Wolfenstein and, and uh, I think it's Wolfenstein and uh, Solitaire. Oh, <laughs> the whole spectrum. And he's like, <laughs> yes and he's like is that it and i'm like yeah that, that's that's what i play right now and i think i came up with like a, a, a disney title at that time i came up with one name of a disney title there you go and then and then uh <laughs> yeah and he'll tell you this is true if i ever talk to him again um a, a few minutes in like he's he's telling me like a little bit about the job and you know what i would have to do and I didn't know anything about game testing. And I just, I, I interrupted him and I said, excuse me, Jeff, do you mind if I just ask you a quick question? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, and I didn't mean it to come out this way, but I was like, game testing, is that like a thing? <laughs> and I'm not, and like to know him, you to love him. He's, he's very dry, but he basically, there was like a long pause to, to me felt like, you know, 20 minutes, but there was a long pause of dead silence. And then he just goes, uh yeah it is. <laughs> and i was like okay and then he just and then he just without missing a beat he just goes back into his wheel and you know he said what do you want to make and i told him and i and he was like okay well you know i've got a bunch of other interviews to to you know to do well you know i'll get back to you and that was like on a i don't remember on a monday or a thursday i can't remember and then I know that I waited like, oh, you know, it was on like a Thursday. And then the following Monday, I got a phone call from him saying, all right, can you come in tomorrow? Oh, and that that's how I got into video games. Literally, dude, it was it was a 10 minute interview that was horrible. <laughs> and, and then I got a job. What you didn't know is the next people that he interviewed only labeled board games. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have to find him and ask him what what made him pick me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. what how bad were the other candidates? Just just yeah, so I know. Everybody else? It's like because you know, like I asked him at one point, you didn't give me this job because you know because you know my sister. And he's like, no, absolutely, I, I did not do that. He was very adamant about that. Yeah, that's good. But I, I didn't ask him why did you pick? Me? <laughs> <laughs> we got to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> <laughs> What was the first game you ever worked on? First game I ever worked on was a game called Maui Mallard. Oh, with Donald. That's like a ninja. That's it. That was yes. my game. Oh, that was that was my game, and I will I will tell you to this day. I haven't played it in a long time, but to to this day, I still love that game. Yeah, it's, probably one it's of cool. My favorite games. It was a fun game. It had incredible music done by Michael Giacchino. I mean, like Grammy Award winning Michael Giacchino. Mm-hmm. Uh, like seriously just an absolutely just just absolute blast to play and uh you know even though i was a tester and you know you have to kind of beat the game to death um sure <laughs> I, I just enjoyed it i just enjoyed it even after doing that and that was so i i started in may i think i started on may 8th was my first day and then somewhere towards the end of May, I was at E3 
showing the game to Michael Eisner. Dude. And, like, and the people like, you know, the head of Toys R Us and Walmart sales and shit like that. Ooh. I was like sitting in front of all these like executives and playing this game on the floor and explaining everything about it. Just like three Whoa. weeks later. It's crazy. How much of the game do you play when you're testing it? It's got to be little chunks, right? Yeah, it's little chunks. Um, yeah. I mean, ultimately, in the end, uh, before it leaves test, I, I usually do playthroughs. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm playing from start to finish, just you know, for fun. Yeah. Um, but in the beginning, it's. I mean, you're you're playing one tenth of one level. You're playing. Ooh. You know. It, it, so if you're thinking about if if you're if you think about like Donkey Kong, uh huh, and you know if you think about the the you know the arcade game Donkey Kong where you have the levels and you know Donkey Kong's at the top and you're and you know Mario's at the bottom. <laughs> I, I'm playing that first level, just that very very bottom play. It. That's gotcha. it. Just jumping around left and right, jumping over a bell. You know, that's it. That's all I'm doing until you know a week later or two weeks later or whatever and then i move up and play the next level you know the next girder that's there that falls and until you know and we're all assigned different areas but we're we're kind of playing through that way so you're only playing a little piece of it just to make sure that you know the music doesn't glitch and the you know you, you don't jump off the screen and you know the pixels are you know, all stay there and there's no occlusion and and you're just writing bug report after bug report and seeing it, hopefully that they fix it. Gotcha. What did you find was like the most common way that games would break? I wouldn't say that I, I would say, I wouldn't say that a lot of times the game would break. I mean, sometimes there was just programming problems and it, oh, it would straight okay. up crash. Uh -huh. uh, but usually it had to do with, it had to do with what your character could do or couldn't do. So, you know, gotcha. if for instance, if you had to jump over a, you have to jump over a barrel, but your character doesn't jump that high. Like every time oh, the barrel, you, okay. like it, you you couldn't get over the barrel. It's like stuff like that, occlusion and and problems like that, or you you know to get to a certain area, you need to have some sort of super jump. So you need to tell them there's no way that you're going to be able to jump and make that. You know, it's just too hard for anybody who's on the first level. Right. So it's usually a lot of conversation back and forth with the lead tester and and you know the associate producers and producers and the designers who are like you know we intended it to, <laughs> we intended for it you know to be that hard right <laughs> okay you know, and then you and they'll just tell us that we don't know how to play it right. like, oh. <laughs> you get a note back get better at the game smiley face yeah <laughs> that, that happened a lot actually. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is the difference between a tester and a lead tester? Um, basically, you're the ones who are responsible for doling out the assignments to the other. Well, I should say this is how it was in 1995. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fair. That's fair. <laughs> um, but that the lead tester was the one who was really writing up the bugs, checking to make sure that they were valid, giving the information over to the associate producers and producers discussing it and making sure that there was an understanding of what the bugs were about and then getting feedback from the associate producers or the developer or publisher, getting that information back over to the test team to make sure that they understood whether or not it was intentional or not. And, and then kind of having that kind of back and forth to, to make sure that uh, everybody's on the same page, whether or not this is going to be fixed or not. And then when the new build comes in, it's kind of up to the tester and the lead tester to be like, hey, did this get fixed? Let's go back through all the bugs that you wrote and make sure that we either close them out or, you know, update them or say it's still there. So that's kind of the lead tester versus the the, the regular tester. That's the, I mean, they're the grunt work, right? They're the ones who are sitting mm -hmm. there all day, all night, just playing and playing and playing and playing and putting in bugs. Gotcha. See, another bit of a surprisingly organizational job. Hmm. Yeah, I became a lead tester three months after I started. Dude. And nine months after um, they offered me a role as a, um associate producer, which I turned down. Oh, how come? Uh, this was a new field for me, and I basically didn't feel like I knew enough about the industry and uh, what I was doing in QA to really be a good producer. 
Yeah, that's very, that's actually very uh, forward thinking of you, like knowing yourself well enough to be like, I want to do this correctly. Yeah, I, I thought so. They, yeah. <laughs> everyone, else thought I could, everyone else thought I was crazy. I was like, that's more money. And you'd be out of here, man. Go play with them where they're making the good money. You know? yeah, I, I'm just not ready for it. I don't think I, I know enough. So I stuck around. I worked on a little bit on Gargoyles and, and Toy Story. And, you know, it's all Disney titles and Maui. Sure. And, uh, one or two others. Pinocchio. And then um, and then uh, finally I went over uh, at about the year mark. I think I went over it like 11 months or something like after I started with the, with the company. And I became an associate producer working on a game called The Rock. Oh, sweet! It was the the it was a game based off of the movie with Nicolas Cage and Ned Harris, and that was uh, wow! That was a colossal waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have those to even out. Yeah, I mean, Disney was making you know money hand over fist at the time, and and they were just investing so much money into this one this one project. And uh, it just did not pan out. It was, you know, it never saw the light of day. I mean, I think that I think they ended up all right. Yeah, they're all right. <laughs> they're, they're, they're doing just fine. <laughs> How long were you at Disney Interactive before you moved over to THQ? Um, oh, there it is. He's reading my stuff. Boom. Um, so uh, I was there for about nine years. I think it was nine and a half years. Wow, that's a years. long time. Yeah, I put in a, a fair amount of time there, and then um, there were some layoffs. They they called it the Voluntary Separation Program, the VSP. Ah, and basically they had told everybody that they intended on lowering headcount uh, for the company, and they gave everyone the opportunity. They said, "Hey, look, if you leave now." We'll give you a, you know, a lot of severance. Well, you know, like four months severance pay and, Ooh. you know, this, that, and the other. And we're like, but I like it here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather keep working. Yeah. So, um, but they said, if we don't meet our numbers uh, by whatever date this was, then, you know, we're going to have to go through and do some layoffs to make up the difference, basically. Oof. And so I had talked to my boss at the time and he had said, oh, no, our team is extremely lean. Um, so we're good. We're good. We're not going to have any layoffs. We're, we're all fine. And three months later, that information changed without us all knowing. Oh, no. So Disney didn't make their numbers uh, for their layoffs. And they ended up going through and doing layoffs. And 50 people were laid off out of my division. And I was one of them. Goodness gracious. Well, you got a lot of experience to go to the next boat then, at least. Yeah. I, as a matter of fact, going over to THQ was uh, was pretty easy uh, because I already worked with THQ as a publishing partner when I was at Disney. Oh. So we, we had been working on a Little Mermaid pro project, and THQ was a publishing partner on that. Nice. And so when the time came and they knew that I was out of work, they asked if I wanted to come work at THQ. And I was like, yeah, sure. And I Why not? Just, yeah. And I, I took the job and, you know, it was, it was nice. I mean, there was good people over there and I already knew them. I knew my, the boss, Carolina Barroza was fantastic. Cool. Uh, some of the people that I worked with, uh, I'm still, you know, even at Disney, by the way, but some of the people I've worked with over the years, uh, I'm still friends with today. I, just, I, I like those people at Disney and I like the people at DHQ. It was, good it, was a, it was a good job you know, working there. That's cool. How long were you at THQ? There, uh, I was there for three years. Okay. Uh, just shy of three years. Um, again, same thing. They did a, a massive cut. Uh, I think... They went from 108 SKUs down to 40, 46 or something like that. Whoa. They were just, they literally cut their workload in half and they got rid of a lot of people. And again, I got caught up in that one. I mean, it was fine because by the time three years had passed, the feeling that I had when I first got there had been waning. You know, like that kind of camaraderie. I know all you people. It was great. It was nice. And then three years later, it felt a lot more, um, a lot more corporate, and mm. not quite as as family as it was when we first started. Sure. 
And so, you know, being laid off from THQ wasn't really wasn't in heart. It was, well, financially, it was a hardship, but, you know, <laughs> mentally, it wasn't mentally. It was fine. I was I was good to go. I was I was happy that I was I was gone. And I mean, you end up moving up like managing an entire VO department at Sound Deluxe. Like you weren't ready to be an associate producer before. Did you feel ready to do this? Yeah. You yeah. know, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, so when I went over to Sound Deluxe, Amanda Wyatt, who was the uh, head legend. of the first over. Ah, yes, yes. She's spectacular. She was the uh, voiceover manager at the time at Sound Deluxe. And Becky Allen, who was the managing director there. And basically, uh, I had already been doing all of this work for voiceover in the job that I was doing over at Disney and in the job I was doing over at THQ. So I I was steeped in this kind of voiceover world. I knew a lot about it, how it was run, what I needed to do with the studios and, you know, prepping the paperwork and everything I needed to do with the actors. So uh, I really was kind of, um, you know, old hand at it. Like I, I, I knew what I needed to do. And then Amanda called me and she basically, Amanda and Becky called me and they said, well, you know, Amanda's going on maternity leave. Do you want to come in and take over this job for a little while until she comes back? I was like, sure. So that was like in July of that year. And I went in and I started working and around October, uh, Amanda called me. She goes, hey, look, here's the thing. I'm not coming back. If you want the job, I'm sure that Becky will keep you on as full time. So I ended up nice. uh, staying at Sound Deluxe for nine and a half years. Ooh. So thinking back to your earlier question, Disney was seven years, and and it was um, it was Sound Deluxe that was nine and a half years. Goodness gracious! Still a good chunk of time. You must have liked it. I did. I did. Uh, you know, I learned a lot while I was there. I had met some amazing people, like a lot of the voice actors who are working today. I was there on their, you know, their early days you know it was great you know i knew that's cool i you know it's nolan north and uh, andrew cascino and you Dude. know you know tara platt and all these Incredible. fantastic fantastic actors who were either just starting out or or were brand new and you know my studio was one of the first jobs that ever they'd ever done and we learned together and i i loved like sitting with you know you know, Yuri Lowenthal in my office, you'd come in and we'd just sit in my office for, love you know, 45 minutes, you know, before and after a session and we would just chat. Like, I love that job. That was a fantastic job. And uh, I kind of miss it. How far at that job, how far into the pipeline is the game when you guys get it? Depending on the studio, but I would say that the vast majority of times when we get the project, the game is pretty close to done. Oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's the way we say it is, you know, voiceover is, a, is you know, well, it's audio is at the ass end of production and right. voiceover is the ass end of voiceover. <laughs> uh, voiceover is at the ass end of audio. So we're at the, the very end of the of the line, right? Got it. We're the last things that they're putting in uh, into the game. So what ends up happening is, you know, they have a deadline for, you know, marketing or release or alpha or whatever it might be. And, you know, they'll call us, you know, five months before and they're like, hey, we want to do some recording with you next month. I'm like, great. And then, you know, the next month comes and they're like, we're not ready yet. And the next month comes and we're not ready yet. And, you know, we get to, you know, two months out and they're like, we're just going to get, we're going to get started, but we got to get it all done in a week. Oh, God. Because, you know, our deadlines are, are not moving. Right. We got very used to working under the gun, you know, being the the red phone to pretty much everybody. You know, they call us and they'd be like, hey, you know, I need to get this thing done, you know, tomorrow. Can you help us out? I'm like, sure. <laughs> You're like, no problem. Like, I've been a club owner. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pe people would just, uh, they would call us and we were always at the end of production and it was always deadlines that couldn't move. So we always had to work under the gun and that was kind of our almost kind of like our claim to fame is like you know we can get it done just give me a call we can get it done i mean that's a good reputation to have you're the one that saves things yeah i mean it, it, the, the beauty of it is that we had built up such a reputation 
with you know all of the agents in the area and local studios that we were working with you know as as opposed to, and that's still our mantra we don't need to compete with everybody we can we can make friends with other studios yeah and work, work with one another so that's what we ended up doing when we were when we were booked we wouldn't say no to somebody we'd say look you know we can give you the work and we have a relationship with the studio down the street we'll help you out we'll get you in we'll we'll do all the 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 negotiations will get you a good price and you can still get your stuff done and you don't have to start over by looking around for another studio and paying top dollar you just come to us man had had the process changed at all being that like technology rapidly changes well yeah i mean overall the basics haven't really changed too much mm-hmm. um you know certainly as technology has gotten uh more sophisticated and you know our clientele have become more sophisticated in what they want to do you know we've had to take into account things like motion capture and facial capture and Mm -hmm. you know going out to a studio versus doing everything in our studio we've had to take all that kind of kind of stuff kind of roll it into the process but overall it's it's really you know it's the same bullet points on how to get production done you know how to get voiceover done for for a video game i would say that some things have changed here and there, but not not that much. I would say nothing's changed, but I can't point to any one one specific thing and be like, "Yeah, that's me." Totally. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. It's all incremental. Yeah. How long were you at Formosa before branching out to Formosa Interactive? Well, Formosa and Formosa Interactive are the same. They didn't start out the same, though, right? What did one branch off into the other? No, no. The way it worked was uh-huh. that um, so Soundlux started tanking around 2013. Mm-hmm. and um i saw the writing on the wall my partner and i julia Amazing. said it's time to go yeah julia's another legend uh, yeah i can i bow down to her she is just an, uh, i know. couldn't have asked for a better partner ever i bet she's just insane insane uh if, if a titan yeah she really is uh, she's written a book she's just a casting director she's she, her mind isn't is, in, is she is incredible to watch work, really. I'm, 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 and I'm not saying enough about her. I really am not. I hired her, and she was working for me in voiceover, and then she went over to sound design over at Sound Deluxe, and then we saw everything that was happening at Sound Deluxe, and we just knew that the, the, you know, the end was nigh. So we were like, all right, it's time to go. And the former president of Sound Deluxe had decided that he was going to go over to what was first Technicolor, then he left Technicolor and he formed Formosa. Aha. Uh-huh. And so when he went over there, it was him and, and like two or three other people. And I gave him a call and I basically said, hey, look, here's the situation. I've got this voiceover department <laughs> where you yeah. used to work. And, uh, you know, I've got staff, I've got clients, I've got uh, a lease that's going to go, uh, that's going to go up on this particular building that we had uh, that we were leasing and that lease is going to be free if you want to pick it up we can just continue working yeah and we had a couple of meetings and we decided that we were going to do it and i joined and we formed formosa interactive so ah. he he was formosa group which was basically him and the three other people were formosa features uh, and then i went over as employee you know julia and i went over as employee one and two of Formosa Interactive. Dude. And then we brought over the, some staff and we brought over uh, all of our clients. We ended up building the studio. And within a couple of months, I think we, we went over in February or something. Oh, no, no, March. I know exactly when we went over. We went over, over in uh, end of February. And then we were up and running and able to record in I think like May 12th or something like that. Wow. Were you nervous? Yeah. Yeah, I was nervous. You got to be, right? Yeah, because we were, I mean, we had already taken Formosa for, you know, we'd already been there for nine years. We we knew how to do this. Yeah. And then we when we leased this new stage for, for Sound Deluxe, we built that stage. We took it from an empty building and made it completely functional with two stages in it and offices and the whole nine. So we had only done it a year before cool. and our sound of Lux, you know, new bosses had decided they were going to let the lease go. 
And that's when we decided we were going to leave and go over to Formosa. And when I went over to Formosa, I was like, well, we just did this like 11 months ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We literally, we, yeah, like the studio was still there and we, and they wouldn't let us have, you know, Satellux wouldn't let us have all the equipment and everything that was in there, even though we offered to buy it. So they cleared out everything, all of the equipment, all of the speakers, all, like everything. And I still had my paperwork. Oh. Or in my my Excel sheets, so we literally took out the Excel sheets and we're like, uh, rebuy, 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 boom, and we, and we bought everything. Ninety percent of it we just bought again. Get it. And two months later, we were up and running. So I was, but I was still nervous because I had to worry about whether or not our clients were going to come over to Formosa or not. Oh, good point. Because everyone had contracts with, you know, we had contracts, they had contracts with Sound Deluxe. Right. And, you know, there was, a, there was a worry about, oh, you know, like, can they actually come over to Formosa? Do they have the ability to actually make those those changes? And in some cases, no, like Sony was one of the, the last ones to come over because they had a contract with, with Sound Deluxe and Sound Deluxe was still functioning. And they, gotcha. they, you know, they didn't want to change things up. Ultimately, in the end, you know, once we started working, I mean, I think from like February through like June or July, Julia and I were like, I hope to God this works. I, yeah, like we were, I bet. You know, <laughs> you know, fingers crossed. We made promises, you know, and, you know, we thought we were going to make, you know, maybe half a million dollars in the first year. Mm -hmm. And we, I think we did 1.1 million. Hell yeah. So, yeah, we, 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 you know, we beat expectations and then we beat expectations every year after that. So it was, it was great. Dude, the success of that, is that where kind of the idea and confidence came from for the help network? Yeah. Although I will tell you that the, the sheer volume of, of fear that we yeah. had, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's nothing can outmatch how we felt uh, in those first few months. Uh, bet. doing doing the help network um you know in all the years uh prior we were we felt pretty good about what we were doing you know Santa Lux year after year after year with very very few uh exceptions we were always making more money we we're meeting new clients people were uh really interested in what we were doing and how we were doing it we did that at Formosa Year after year, we got better and better and better. Um, but then this time was different because we were doing a brand new model. We were we were taking a look at what we had learned from Sound Deluxe and what we would learn from Formosa and said to ourselves, what can we do better? What can we what what do we want to keep? What do we want to throw away? Right. Yeah. And and we want to make this a a better experience for not just the clients, but it, it had to be a better experience for the people who are working there. Sure. Right. Our employees. So that was something that we were hell bent on making sure we were focused on. You know, there's something about going to a job, uh, you know, day after day after day, and you are absolutely just hating it. Oh, for sure. That affects right? your soul. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And if you're not enjoying the day-to-day, -day, then, then why are you doing this, right? This, is, Especially if, if it's a field that you feel like you, that you want to be in, but yeah. you're still not enjoying it, right? This is like, you know, if an engineer is not enjoying being an engineer, then why be an engineer? Well, because okay. I like being an engineer. I just don't like being an engineer here. Yeah. <laughs> Right. right. That's kind of, that's what it is. So we took a look at a, a lot of the things that we loved and a lot of the things that we hated and we talked it out and we determined that we were going to make a new kind of company. We were not going to be performative. We were not going to just, you know, say the things and have platitudes. We were literally going to do the things that we say we wanted to do and make things work. And yeah. we, we, took time to kind of understand what our business was. And it took a long time to yeah. understand what our business was. Um, <laughs> but we, we 
you know, put our money, you know, behind it and put our time behind it. And we, we made something that we are extremely proud of. Especially to come from like your brains and to build it yourself. There's got to be an extra level of kind of satisfaction of like, it worked, it worked. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we are still like, we, not that long ago, we were just talking about how we are so blessed that this has worked out the way even better than we had expected. Um, yeah. we, we talk about it quite often about it, like, oh my God, can you believe we did this? <laughs> it's like, you know, and and not kidding you, those first few months, oof. I mean, oof, we were, we, I, I don't know if I'm going to let the curse on your Oh yeah, for sure. I already cursed a couple of times, but yeah, we were shitting bricks. We were like really worried because we're like the difference between going from sound Deluxe to Formosa and that worry about whether or not the clients would come over. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Formosa had the backing of a big company, right? Formosa right. group and features and, you know, and a president who had been in this business for like 25 years already and all of this uh history and there was money there so if something went wrong you know the sony's and the microsoft's and the nintendo's of the world wouldn't feel that bad here you're going from formosa or sound Deluxe to two people in their garage <laughs> to the new guy on the block right yeah new guy on the block who's gotten you know aside from our individual history we didn't have a uh, we didn't have a studio. We didn't want a studio. We decided that we were now that was kind of smart cut costs. Yeah, we're going to cut costs. We're not going to have overhead. You know, we're going to have as more or very, very little overhead. Mm -hmm. We're going to try and keep it as low as possible, and we're going to have our clients save money. Yeah, they're going to get quality work, and they're going to get it from great people, but they're going to not pay as much. That's yeah. that's the goal here. And we just didn't know that whether or not people were going to come. Yeah. Do you remember the and first person that did? Yes. Uh, yeah. Our first client. Well, our first, the first person who said they were coming was uh, Brooks Guthrie. Cool. Of Bio uh, and he brought us uh, the Star Wars project. Dude. Uh, so we took, um, you know, Star Wars and we, have been working on that ever since. And then we had a uh, National Geographic came in. Uh, they were the first company that stiffed us on money. Ah, um, so classic. <laughs> you know, but that 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 happens. We learned a lesson. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and we had a partnership with uh, Dara O'Farrell of O'Farrell Enterprises. Cool. He was a signatory for Interactive. Uh, and he gave us a break. He gave us a, a loan so that we can, you know, buy all the things that we needed to buy and computers and stuff like that. And, and we paid him back within the, I think, uh, within 18 months we paid him, we were completely in black and, and we're able to pay him back. Dude, how does that feel now? Cause like you went for it and so far it's, it's working out. Um, there is an immense amount of appreciation that I can't put into words Yeah, for all of the people who have, who have taken their time to listen to what we're trying to do when we went out to GDC and, you know, two weeks after, you know, after we had started the company and, and explained to them what we're doing mm -hmm. and they, they listened and they understood and they trusted us and that, I think that's the key thing is that we have so many good people in our business, in our industry, who who trusted us to, to handle their baby, right? Their, the project that they've been working on for the last six months, 12 months, 18 months, and they're giving it over to someone and saying, okay, here's my baby. I need you to take care of this. And they did that. They gave it to us and we did everything we could do to make sure that when we gave them back their files and their, and we brought in their, their actors and we brought them to a studio that they were treated with an immense, an immense amount of respect. And we, we just did quality work and they didn't know, they didn't know what was going to happen. Right. There's just so trust they, there. Yeah. So I, I think that's the one thing that I can tell you is that I am forever grateful to 
all of those people. Matter of fact, um, March 11th, I believe it is, which is a Saturday, Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to be celebrating our fifth anniversary. Oh, dude, congratulations. And we've invited about uh, 250 people uh, to, you know, invitation only to this event. Yeah. uh, Just to say, hey, you know, you have played a, a vital part in who we are today. And we want to say thank you. So it's all about saying thank you to all the people. So gratitude and appreciation, those are the words that come to my mind. Um, that's how that's how I feel every day. I I am going to retire doing this. Yeah. You know, this is this is the last, or I think it's going to be the last <laughs> job I have. And I feel like our mission is clear. Um, I feel like we're very purposeful in what we try and accomplish. Mm-hmm. And there's just a handful of people out there who allow us to do that. And that's that's where my mind is. Oh, I love that. Do you have any advice for anyone who like is going out and venturing on their own thing and like, you know, is out there trying to do the thing? Yeah, I could tell you there's there's one or two things I would tell you. Um or tell them, don't let someone tell you that you can't. Ooh. That's I, I think that's one of the the one of the major things that happened over the course of leaving, you know, leaving Sound Deluxe to go to Formosa and leaving Formosa to do the health network. Mm-hmm. Is that there were there were just like several people who just said you're making a mistake. And you know you better than they know you right yeah. you know what's in your heart and if you are and this is part of you know the second thing i want to say is if you are dedicated to the goal then you'll succeed it may not su- success doesn't have to be money and that's one of our mantras like we don't need to make a lot of money yeah right we're you know this is a capitalistic society and we all need to make money so we can pay our bills and you know keep a roof over our heads and that kind of thing we totally understand that but nobody i i our company doesn't need to be rich i'd rather give the money to the people who are working here and make sure that they're feeling good and and happy to be here and you know you know pay for our work we're going to i'm taking everyone on the, on the team over to nintendo uh new nintendo world over at universal cool. um, just just to have some fun for the day. I took them all to Catalina just to hang out for the day. Yeah. You know, they worked so freaking hard. This is this is one of the the you know the, one of the best things I can tell you is you know you better than anybody. You know what you're going to be dedicated to do. You're going to know that if if you are focused, you can succeed and success doesn't necessarily mean money. Yeah. Right? Success is happiness. Yeah. So I would say look towards happiness as being your goal. I love that. And just like that, Chip, we've been talking for over an hour. You survived. Holy shit. Look at you. (laughs) (laughs) I had my doubts, but here we are. (laughs) I did too. I did too. But this is great, man. Thank you so much for, for, first of all, and your patience, because I was sick last week. Um, (laughs) And I don't think I, I, I think I only called once in this uh, entire podcast. That's okay. Um, That's what post is for. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for the insightful questions and for, you know, for, for digging into my, into my past and, and, uh, and reminding me of some of the fun things that I've done and, and how far I've come. And uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, several more years of this. Yeah, me too. So, dude, before I let you back into the wild, I got to ask, where can people find you online? Where can they find your stuff? Talk to me. So, for the company, um, we are uh, at helpnetwork.com or helpnet.com. Um, you can find us there. Uh, that's our website. And then on Instagram and across all social media, you can find us either at Help Academy or help network um the help network is our main company uh, that's the production side of our business and help academy is the education side of our business where we actually do panels and classes and workshops and things like that so kind of two things going there so you can check out all the cool projects that we've worked on and then if you're interested in taking classes 
uh, or learning about how to be a voice actor or the differences between uh, composing for video games versus composing for film and TV, uh, you might want to check out the Help Academy. Um, Help, it's the uh, Help, the full name is the Help Network Entertainment Academy, but you can find it online. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then for me, I'm pure Chip Beeman, fully spelled out, P-U-R-E-C-H-I-P, uh, B-E-A-M-A-N. And that's across all social media. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find my demos, short films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, and Chris. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.